So if we move on to motilities, and I guess this is where most people who are thinking about binocular vision sort of uh, get extremely worried. So um, I'm going to um, reassure you, I'm not going to talk about details of anatomy and physiology, but just to give you some tips to, to make it much easier. So the best way of doing it is probably to use a focus pen torch placed at 50 centimetres, although this can get a little bit tricky um, if you're trying to do a cover test, which you should be doing in all nine cardinal points of, of gaze. Make sure that you don't move your pen torch too far to the periphery. If you do, you're bound to find some incompetences that you don't want to see. And it's perfectly reasonable, very, very far out in the extremes of gaze, when the patient's outside of their binocular field of view, for whatever reason, the eyebrow or nose, that they're going to find it difficult to maintain single binocular vision. So since we know that the extraocular muscles join on at the ISA superior rectus at about 23 degrees. You don't need to go much more if you're trying to test a superior rectus or inferior rectus than 23 degrees primary position. The obliques are a little bit more, so you don't really need to go any more than about 45 or 50 degrees to test their effectivity. And I would suggest that you, you try very hard not to go any further out than that whilst you're doing motilities. Before you start though, it's really important to have a look at the pupil reflexes in each eye because as you're aware, the reflex from your pen light may not actually be in the pupil center if the corneal center is actually not coincident with the pupil center. And angle kappa is quite an important um, measurement, or not a measurement, but it's a, uh, an important factor to take into consideration. So start off by occluding one eye and asking your patient to fixate your pen torch. Note where the pupil reflex is. You know that that is straight ahead for that patient and do the same thing in with, with the other eye because the two eyes of course could be different. When you're doing motilities it doesn't really matter whether you use your H pattern or whether you use a star pattern, whatever you become more comfortable with is okay, but it does matter quite significantly if you move your pen torch too fast. And in the days where we had PQE, some of the candidates were uh, very rapid and that precludes from actually seeing uh, any anomalies of binocular vision because you don't give the patient a chance either to tell you what it is or yourself a chance to be able to, to observe whether you have an overaction or an underaction. Now, I would always advise practitioners when they're doing motility tests not to try and work out which eye muscle is which unless they're quite confident and experienced. And if you haven't done a lot of binocular vision work, trying to work out which of the muscles is misbehaving is a nightmare. So I would just draw a diagram and a picture or write down what the eyes did. And then when the patient's gone home, you can get your textbooks out and you can have a bit of a look. As I've said before, remember when you're doing motilities, always do a cover test, especially if you find any anomalies in, in the nine cardinal points of gaze. And remember that actually technically, moving the pen torch vertically through the midline isn't part of the motilities test because it doesn't test any particular muscle groups in, in their sort of fullest extent. But it does help you identify whether the patient has so-called alphabetical patterns, an A pattern or an X pattern or a V pattern. And that will help you understand why the patient may be decompensating um, in the distance, for instance, if there's a V pattern, which indicates there's an increasing exophoria as the patient looks up. And incidentally, relating that to the way that you observe your patients with a V-pattern v will alter his head posture in order to make it easy so he'll lift his head a little bit so that he, he finds convergence a bit easier. If you see something that you're not really uh, sure about, that you do the motilities tests up to three times. On the first occasion, you don't let the patient speak, you just observe. And the trouble with patients is that they'll tell you blurred is double and they don't really know what you're thinking or what you're trying to observe at any one time. So if they get diplopia in many positions of gaze, they're going to be constantly telling you you've got, they've got double vision or blurred vision. And actually that makes it hard for you to observe and think. So do it start with just with a simple observation and cover test. Secondly, ask your patient to explain to you or tell you when they experience double vision. 
And as you're going around and they're telling you that they're getting double vision, try and get the patients to tell you on each occasion whether it's more or less than the preceding occasion so that you can identify the direction of gaze which produces the largest separation. If you then want to work out and you're not completely sure what's going on, um, most of us have got trial sets and most of us have got red and green filters in those trial sets. If you put those on the patient, you can then actually work out very easily which image belongs to which eye when the patient is diplopic as you're doing a motilities test. It's actually a really quite a, an easy thing to do. And then you can draw a little diagram in all nine cardinal points as to which eye is seeing what and, and where, and that will help you work out which muscles are overacting or underacting. A really good tip is when patient reports double vision, ask them to observe the position of the two images and notice that one is further away compared to them than the other. Cover one eye and ask them which image disappears the nearest or the further. And from our point of view, it's always rather good because the furthest image always belongs to the underacting eye. So you'll instantly know which eye is uh, underacting. Remember though, one of the problems with motility is testing, and we always think about single muscles that are misbehaving, is that you can have a lot that have gone wrong, particularly if the patient's previously had surgery for squints. And you get ocular, you, you get muscle sequelae, which then can kind of equalize the movements and make it much more difficult for you to work out which one's which. But don't dismiss the possibility that your patient might have two or three eye muscles that are misbehaving.